In this video tutorial, we will introduce the topics of acids and bases. Most students are familiar with the term acids, but maybe not so much with bases. Well, an acid is a substance that dissociates in water, so that means when it dissolves in water, it breaks up, producing one or more hydrogen ions, shown with the symbol H+, because it has lost an electron. On the other hand, a base is a substance that dissociates in water, so it dissolves in water, and then breaks up to form one or more hydroxide ions, so that's OH-. So if you look at the list of acids I have over here, you'll notice that every single one of them has an H plus ion inside the chemical formula. So when dissolved in water, we say it's aqueous. The water molecules will then split these guys up, releasing H plus ions and Br minus ions. In this case over here, it releases one H plus and an HSO4 ion. And over here, H plus is released and a ClO4 minus. It is this H plus ion that gives acids its acidic properties. So the more H plus ions floating around in solution, the more acidic that acid is. The opposite is also true. If there are fewer H plus ions floating around in solution, then it's going to be a weaker acid. So something like citric acid that you would find in orange juice or lemon juice, or something like vinegar, acetic acid, things that we would use in our cooking or food products will have fewer H plus ions inside of it. It would be less acidic than something like hydrochloric acid. All right. So hydrochloric acid we would use in our stomachs to help us digest food, whereas acetic acid, vinegar, or citric acid, lemon lime juice, those things are used to flavor our foods because they're weaker acids. I would certainly hope that you do not flavor your food with hydrochloric acid, a much stronger acid. Over on the right hand side, we have a list of bases. You'll notice that every single one of them has a hydroxide ion in their chemical formula. So during the process of dissociation, when they dissolve in water, making an aqueous solution, they will release a lithium ion, but also the hydroxide ion. In this case over here, the potassium and the hydroxide will split up, while the barium and the hydroxides will also split up. Now, keep in mind that this last reaction over here is a skeleton equation. It is not balanced. In an unbalanced equation, the barium hydroxide would release one barium, but it would release two hydroxide ions. Now, just like acids, the more hydroxide ions floating around your solution, the more basic the solution is going to be. Furthermore, the presence of these free moving ions, now that they're free to move around, they're no longer stuck in position, allows them to conduct electricity in their aqueous form. So aqueous meaning dissolved in water. If you recall from an earlier lesson, solutions that can conduct electricity are known as electrolytes. As I mentioned earlier, most students are familiar with the term acids. They know that it tastes sour, so lemon juice, lime juice, orange juice citric fruits, and some may be aware that acids conduct electricity, which is where they probably heard the term battery acid. Now, acids can react with metals to produce hydrogen gas, so here we have magnesium reacting with hydrochloric acid in a single displacement reaction. Please press pause and try and predict the products of this reaction. When you're ready, press play and we'll take it up. So in this single displacement reaction, the magnesium is going to bump out the hydrogen because we always have to have a positive and negative partnership. The old partners were positive and negative. The new partners must be positive and negative. We can't combine the magnesium and the hydrogen together because the two positive charges would repel. So we need to check and see if the magnesium can displace or push out the hydrogen and take its place, thereby bonding with the chlorine instead. For that, we would consult our activity series. Only elements at the top will be able to bump out those at the bottom. So here we see magnesium is more reactive than the hydrogen, which means the magnesium is allowed to displace or bump out the hydrogen. We now have magnesium and chlorine bonded together. Don't forget to zero sum, MgCl2. And of course, hydrogen is not allowed to be by itself because it is diatomic. So don't forget the number two subscript here. And that is one way in which acids react with metals to produce hydrogen gas. Acids can also react with carbon-based compounds to produce CO2, but we'll look at those reactions in a future course. As we mentioned, common examples or uses of acids in the home, citric fruits, so lemons, limes, oranges, uh, vinegar, acetic acid, carbonic acid is typically found in soft drinks, and much, much more. Acids are quite commonplace in our everyday lives. Now, the term bases may not be as familiar with students, but you're definitely familiar with their uses in the home. Quite often, our cleaning agents are basic in nature, so oven cleaner, baking soda, glass cleaner, even a bar of soap is typically going to be basic. Many medications are also basic, which helps to explain why so many taste bitter. Again, due to the freely moving ions, 
bases can also conduct electricity, where the greater the concentration of the ions, the more conductivity it has. Finally, the reason why most cleaning agents are basic in nature is because they are able to react with proteins and other organic compounds in order to break them down to smaller molecules. So large molecules like fats and grease can be broken down by bases into smaller molecules, making it easier to clean them off. Now we can create acids by taking a non-metal and then burning it. As in most cases, when you burn something, you need oxygen. By burning a non-metal, like in this case sulfur, with oxygen, you create a non-metal oxide. So in this case, sulfur plus oxygen creates a sulfur oxide. From there, you take the non-metal oxide, add it with water, and then you produce an acid. So as an example, gasoline quite often contains some sulfur atoms inside. When we burn gasoline, we also burn that sulfur, creating a non-metal oxide. This non-metal oxide comes out the exhaust pipe of cars, eventually ending up in the atmosphere. Guess what else is in the atmosphere? Water! And that's where we get sulfuric acid coming down as acid rain. Another component of acid rain is carbonic acid. That is produced from the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Carbon, non-metal. Oxide, non-metal oxide. So when you take a non-metal oxide, combine it with water, you will make an acid. And that's how soda stream machines work in order to give you fizzy carbonated water. They pump canisters of carbon dioxide, mix it with the water, in the process producing carbonic acid. So we call these carbonated drinks. Now you can think of acids and bases as being opposites of each other. If we use a non-metal oxide to produce an acid, then we must use a metal oxide to produce a base. Again, take a metal, burn it, and create a metal oxide. From there, just add water, and now you have a base. When it comes to their nomenclature, or naming them, bases are fairly straightforward as they follow the polyatomic naming conventions. So lithium hydroxide, L-I-O-H, or beryllium hydroxide, B-E-O-H-2. Just make sure that you follow the zero-sum rule. So press pause and take a moment to fill up these four. When you're done, press play and we'll take it up together. Alright, so MgOH2, magnesium hydroxide. NaOH, sodium hydroxide. Aluminum hydroxide, make sure you remember that aluminum has a 3 plus valence charge. So when you zero sum, I need three of these hydroxides. Don't forget to keep the brackets on over here because we're referring to three hydroxides and not just three hydrogens. So the brackets are necessary. And finally, calcium hydroxide. Calcium is a 2 plus charge, so when I zero sum, I'm going to need two of these hydroxides in order for this to zero sum properly. Unfortunately, naming acids is a little more complicated. There are two naming systems that we're going to be looking at. The first is a binary acid, while the other one is called an oxy acid, or sometimes called an oxo acid. These ones are called binary acids because binary means two, and each one involves only two elements, hydrogen and chlorine, hydrogen and sulfur hydrogen and fluorine, etc, etc. While these ones are called oxy acids because every single one of them contains an oxygen inside. Now when it comes to binary acids, they follow this following format. Put the prefix hydro, change the suffix to an ic, and you've got an acid. So over here we have a Cl, chlorine, make it hydrochloric acid. H2S is hydrosulfuric acid, while HF is hydrofluoric acid. Now going in the opposite direction, we know there's always going to be an H in the front with a 1 plus charge. In this case, it's hydrophosphoric acid, so that means there's a phosphorus atom over here. Hydrogen has a 1 plus charge, phosphorus with a 3 minus charge, so I need to have 3 hydrogens for this to zero sum properly. For these other two, they all only have a valence charge of 1 minus, so it's already zero sum, no need for any subscripts. Hydroiodic acid, HI, hi, and hydrobromic acid, HBr. Moving to the other side we see that they have removed the hydro prefix. Since this is a sulfate ion, we name it sulfuric acid. The iodate turns into iodic acid, while the phosphate becomes phosphoric acid. We can then repeat the pattern on this side. So bromic refers to the bromate, BrO3 with a 1 minus charge. We start off with an H, 1 plus charge, and the bromate, 1 minus charge, everything's zero sum, no need for additional subscripts, we're good. Nitric acid, refers to the nitrate ion NO3 1 minus giving us H NO3 zero sum that's good and chloric acid gives us HClO3 zero sum that's good so you'll notice that when it comes to binary acids we only deal with two elements at a time while oxy acids must deal with the polyatomic ions the ones that contain oxygen inside of them 
Binary acids have the prefix hydro, while oxy acids do not have the prefix hydro. Otherwise, everything else about it is the same. Ic acid. Another reason why you can think of acids and bases as being opposites of each other is because they cancel each other out in a chemical reaction known as a neutralization reaction. Looking at this reaction, you can see that it is a type of double displacement reaction, where they each switch places, providing a brand new partner. Now, if you recall from a previous lesson, I recommended that you stop thinking of water as H2O and start thinking of it as hydrogen hydroxide instead. This will help you when you're trying to predict the products of this chemical reaction because now the hydroxide makes a new partner with the hydrogen to form water. And this is certainly helpful when you're trying to balance the equation as well. So during a neutralization reaction, an acid and a base will cancel each other out through a double displacement reaction, producing an ionic salt and water. Now when we use the word salt in chemistry, there are two meanings. There's NaCl, which is table salt, the type that we use and put in our food. But there's also ionic salt, which is a very general term we like to use in chemistry to describe an ionic compound. Alright, so table salt, the type that we put in our food, sodium chloride, and then ionic salt, just a general term meaning ionic compound, usually one that dissolves well in water. Now as we saw earlier, acids can react with metals in a single displacement reaction, so please predict the following chemical reaction. Press pause, when you're ready press play, and we will take it up. Alright, so this is cationic single displacement, where the cations are going to displace each other. Again, check the activity series. Magnesium is higher, so it can bump out the hydrogen, creating the brand new partner of magnesium and sulfate. Don't forget to zero sum. In this case, it's fine, 2 and 2, so we don't need any subscripts. But hydrogen is, of course, diatomic, so don't forget the 2. Now, the problem with neutralization reactions is that it's hard to tell when the reaction's over, or even if the reaction occurs. That's because acids tend to be clear, colorless, transparent, aqueous solutions, and so are bases. Clear, colorless, transparent, aqueous solutions. And when they react together, you make salt water, which again is clear, colorless, transparent, and aqueous. So here you have a situation where all four substances look like water. So how can you tell that the reaction has happened? Now, I don't recommend that you lick it. Obviously, the acid will taste sour and the base will taste bitter, but they both taste like burning, so that is not recommended. Instead, we can use something called an indicator. This is a chemical substance that changes different colors in the presence of an acid or a base. Now, there are many different types of indicators out there, but a cool one you can make at home is found in red cabbage. There is a chemical inside these red cabbages called anthocyanin that changes color depending on how many hydrogen or hydroxide ions are floating around your solution. The anthocyanin turns a little more bluish-greenish if you expose it to hydroxide ions, but becomes a little more pinkish-reddish if you expose it to hydrogen ions. And so we refer to this chemical as an indicator, because it indicates if it's going to be an acidic or basic solution, because it would be hard to distinguish between an acid and a base without it. Now, we use something called the pH scale to measure how acidic or how basic a substance is. Specifically, the pH scale measures how much H plus ions are floating around inside the solution. In case you want to know, the pH comes from the Latin term pondus hydrogeni, which roughly translates to the potential or the power of the hydrogen ion. Now, this scale goes from 0 to 14. If you want to know why, you'll have to take grade 12 chemistry. But essentially, solutions that have the same number of hydrogens and same number of hydroxides, well, then they would turn into water. And pure water has a pH of 7, so we call this pH neutral. Because it's neither an acid, nor is it a base, it's both of them together, cancelling each other out to create water. On the other hand, if your pH is below 7, from 0 to 7, it is considered to be acidic, while if the pH is between 7 and 14, it's considered to be basic. Now you don't need to know too much about the pH scale itself, but essentially the scale is logarithmic. What that means is each jump on the scale goes up by a factor of 10. So if I have a solution that's a pH of 2 and another solution that's a pH of 4, this is not twice as acidic, it is actually 10 times 10, so 100 times more acidic. So on a logarithmic scale, each jump on the scale is actually a factor of 10. Same thing, pH of 6 versus pH of 3, it's not twice as acidic. It's 10 times 10 times 10, 1000 times more acidic. Alrighty, now it's actually a negative logarithmic scale. But don't worry about this, we'll talk more about it in grade 12 if you plan on punishing yourself by taking that course. But in any case, cool course, I recommend it. 
In any case, this diagram over here shows you roughly how acidic or how basic each of these common household items are. Like drain cleaner and bleach, baking soda is only slightly basic, while milk is slightly acidic, and of course water is neutral in the middle. Apple juice, lemon juice, they're both on the acidic side of things, and of course stomach acid right over here, pH of 1.5. As we will learn in our biology unit, the stomach acid is used to break down foods. All right, so here's some additional information about acid-base indicators, but other than that, this concludes our chemistry unit.